Again, I want to thank you for being here this morning. And uh, you know, I know we don't have the large crowd, but I don't, I don't have a half a bushel today, so you get the whole bushel whether you're small or whether you're big. <laughs> So this morning, what I want to do is I want to revisit, I want to review, I want to sort of wrap up the messages of the last five weeks and put them together. But all the messages that we've had so far this year in the Gospel of Luke, so next week we're just going to actually move out of chapter 4. We're going to skip ahead a couple chapters, and we're going to go all the way into chapter 9. So there's a lot of information this morning, but I'm confident that we'll be able to get through it. And uh, you've got some handouts there, and in those handouts... Uh, you know, there's some pins in the back of the table. A handout will always help you remember what you're doing, remember what you hear, if you take the time to write it down, and then you can always save it for later. So anyway, there's a lot of information this morning, but I'm confident we're going to get through it. And like I told you when I started these messages on uh, temptation, I couldn't be fair to you, I couldn't be fair to me, I couldn't be fair to the scriptures to do it all in one section. So this was so important, I just felt like we needed to land here for a little while and sit here yeah, because every one of us, whether you believe Jesus is who he says he is or don't believe Jesus is who he says he is, we are tempted either in a small way or a large way every day, all day, in many ways. So we all have that one thing in common that brings us together is that we all face and we're all tempted. Now, let you know right now, you don't want to miss next week. Next week we may have a few little surprises for you. Next week is what we call the Transfiguration Sunday on the church calendar. So we're going to skip ahead all the way into chapter 9. And if you want to read ahead, I'll tell you it's Luke chapter 9. And you start reading about the Transfiguration. But because it is on the church calendar, we know that the message will be uh, very important. So come on back and bring a friend with you. So we sort of review. We, we start out the year by giving you the evidence that what we've been taught is truth. We start out here by giving the evidence of what's written in these ancient scriptures that we call our Bible isn't some kind of made-up fairy tale. It's not some kind of fable, but it's actual truth. These are events that took place on history. They've been recorded by those who heard them or saw them or by those who interviewed those who saw them or recorded them or and recorded them people who were actual witnesses to these events. And so often in history, we take for granted the things we read, but when it comes to a scripture some, for some reason, even though there's more evidence of these scriptures than there are most of the things that we take for granted in history, people just don't seem to want to believe it. And I think they don't want to believe it because there, there's miracles that take place here. There's a guy who says he was God and they died and he was resurrected. These are things that we have a hard time comprehending with our mind, so we say, well, I'm not sure if that's really true. But the evidence that we saw from both religious sources and non-religious sources said everything in this word is true. The evidence is there. The people who wrote these, and, and Peter and John tell us that these are the evidence of the things we saw and heard with our own ears and our own eyes. And one of the people who did a lot of careful investigation and carefully wrote about what he found was this Dr. Luke that we've been looking at since the beginning of the year, the one that had written this gospel that we've been studying. And he tells us right in the introduction why he wrote this letter, or he even calls it a book, why he wrote this book. So you can fill out the blanks as we go along. This person was coming, have carefully, he says, I have, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I've also decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus. And Theophilus means lover of God. So he says, you lover of God, you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. You can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Now, as I believe, and as I think we've proven, these scriptures are true. And since this is the word of God, we should not just know about them. We should know them so well that we can apply them to our life. Because without application, there's no transformation. So what we did is we started out with the end in mind. What should our life look like if we're truly a disciple of Christ? What should our life look like if we're actually following Jesus and then made him not just our Savior, but made him the Lord over our life as well? Because as we heard in the scriptures, man shall not serve but one God. Man shall not serve but the Lord himself. That means if you're serving somebody and you're calling Lord, you're surrendering your will to their will. So what would our life look like? How do we want to look if we really know that we're doing the things that God has told us to do. So we begin with the end of mind. 
What is the proof for living by God's will? We put it like this in one of the first messages. How will we know for sure that we will enter heaven's orbit? You know, because here's what. I, I checked the mortality rate around the world. I've, I've done all the statistics. And so far, the best I can find, the mortality rate around the world is 100%. We're all going to die someday. Unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to go through this door of death one day. And most people, if you were to interview most of the people in the world, they're going to say, yes, there is a God. And they're all going to say, not only is there a God, but there's a good place and a bad place. That there is life after this life, and there's a good place or a bad place that we can end up. And I don't know about you, I will end up in a good place. The place that we call, in our world, heaven. No. And, if, and again, I believe we've proven it. If these scriptures are true, and I believe the evidence points that they are true, what is the proof we're headed in the right direction? What is the proof that we're going to get into that good place? And I think that's a great question. I mean, I want to, and I hope you want to, to know for sure that we're going to head over the door. And John, who is an old covenant, old covenant, not old testament, old covenant prophet, which means he's speaking on behalf of God, he tells us how we can know if we're headed in the right direction. Luke, who, after careful investigation, wrote these words with John the Baptist, began to proclaim as he was announcing the arrival of Jesus, which was fulfillment of prophecy written about 700 years before, a little over 700 years before, John was actually born. So at the arrival of Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, in lesson two, the evidence our lives possess, what our mouths confess, is this. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Repent means to change the way you think, to turn around, to quit thinking about yourself and your world and start thinking about God and His world. And since we know, because Matthew and Luke both tell us when they record these histories of this event, that when John said these words, he was talking to the religious people. He wasn't talking to the people who were not religious. He was talking to religious people. And that's a concern of mine because most of us come to church would say that we're religious people, that we are Christians. So I think this is something that we all need to take seriously. Both those who believe Jesus is who he says he is and those who don't believe Jesus is who he says he is. Because we don't want to hear these words at the end of our life. These are the words that Jesus himself said. I mean, I apologize, I got ahead of myself there. John says, Prove by the way you live that you repent of your sins and turn to God. But right after that, he gives us a very stern warning. And then John the Baptist, he gives us a warning. Even now, even now, means right now, the axe of God's judgment is poised. It's raised. It's ready to go. Ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. That's a pretty strong warning. And it may not be as easy as some people think to get into heaven. I, 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 I wonder about that. As I look at it, I say, in other words, does my lifestyle possess what my mouth confesses? Am I doing what I say I'm doing? Am I, does my lifestyle say that I'm a Christian? Or do just my words say I'm a Christian? Do I look like what I say I am? Do I look like a disciple of Jesus Christ? And if I look at my life and it does reflect that of Jesus, if I don't look like that disciple, if I'm not bearing any fruit, then I really need to reevaluate my confession of faith, because I don't want to stand before the Lord one day, and we all will stand before the, the Lord one day. And these are words that Jesus spoke himself. They're, they're recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, that means not everyone who says they're a Christian, not everyone who calls out and says, Jesus is my Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. He tells us how will enter into the kingdom. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. If you're not doing God's will, you may get to heaven, and on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name, we did things in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we perform many miracles in your name, but I will reply, because I'm looking into your heart, and I saw how you live, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break. God's laws. That's a pretty strong warning. It comes from Jesus himself. So it may not be as easy as some people make it out to be to get into heaven. Yes, God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy, but God is still God. 
And just because you say you're a Christian, just because you say you're a believer, doesn't mean you'll enter into the kingdom of heaven. Your lifestyle should possess what your mouth confesses. And the evidence of your words professes is the fruit of your life. You know, if you think about it, the only real way to know what's inside a piece of food is to squeeze it, right? I mean, you don't know how much juice is in an orange or how sweet it is until you squeeze it. And there, I mean, it may look pretty, but until you squeeze it, you don't know what's in it. And I think there's a lot of pretty Christians out there. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. But you squeeze them, and you see what comes out. We should prove by the way we live we repented and turned from our sin. This is how John the Baptist says our lives should look like if we call Jesus our Lord and Savior. Because it's when you're squeezed that you find out what's really inside of you. Do you trust Jesus just as your Savior or have you really made Him your Lord? And the squeeze is the test. The squeeze of temptation is the test sometimes to find out if you really made Jesus the Lord of your life and you trust Him that He has your best interest at heart no matter what you're going through. Because I know that a lot of people like the Savior part I know I did for years. Jesus is my Savior. But honestly, I never surrendered. My life didn't reflect that Jesus was my Lord. I mean, I liked Him as my Savior, but to make Him Lord, that was tough. So if you don't produce any fruit, or worse yet, you produce bad fruit, you could be in trouble on Judgment Day. And since the mortality rate is 100% worldwide, we all know, at least I hope we know, there's going to be a Judgment Day for each one of us. So we started by saying this is the goal. This is where we wanted to achieve. And then we take ourselves where we're at and say, well, how do I get from where I'm at to what I want to achieve? So we know what our goal is. We know what our life should look like if we claim to be a follower of Jesus. But there is this thing that's in our life that keeps us from doing what we know we should be doing and not doing what we know we, you know, it keeps us from doing what we know we shouldn't do and keeps us from doing what we should do and then don't do. And I believe the number one thing that keeps us from living the way God wants us to live for, it is the same thing that caused this mess in the first place. And that's the squeezing of temptation. I mean, Adam and Eve were tempted in the Garden of Eden by the devil himself and it's sort of been downhill ever since. And we can try to blame it on Adam and Eve. I know a lot of people are arguing that heaven. My mom said that one time. When I get to heaven, I've got some questions for Adam and Eve. You think about this. They lived in a perfect environment with a perfect relationship with God, yet they still were tempted and fell into sin. Amen. So you know, you know we're going to be tempted, and you're going to know that on occasion we're going to fall into sin. And I thank God that we're covered by the blood of Christ. But the direction of our lives should be towards God and not towards ourselves. We should be directed towards the cross and not towards ourselves. And when we look at our lives, we should be able to see that we are making progression. It's not about perfection, but we should be achieving some progression. We live in this broken world, and our sin has broken our relationship with our Heavenly Father, and therefore we're at more than a risk than Adam and Eve were, and we all know that we've given into temptation at one time or another. And I think that's really what the story of these temptations are. It's Jesus wanted one thing. He wanted an unbroken relationship with his Father. Because if he could have an unbroken relationship with his Father, everything else his Father promised him would come to him. Yes. But if he broke that relationship, then there were going to be consequences to that. And we know we can't obtain perfection, but we should be achieving progression. Our lives should look different. Our actions should be different. Better. Our love for everyone, even our enemies, because it's easy to love those that love us, but those that come against us, they're harder to love. That should go stronger just every day by just a little bit, every day just in a little way. We should be better yesterday than we were the day before. We should be better today than we were yesterday. And we should look at our lives and we should be better this year than we were last year. And the good news is, the good news is, when Satan comes against us, the devil comes against us, we all know that. But there is one that has already defeated the devil. There's only one, but the author of the book of Hebrews tells us who it is. He said, because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Sometimes we think, well, he had to face the same temptations we fought in the same way we fight. 
and human flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. See, we forget that one thing. The death comes from sin. Jesus could be nailed to the cross, and if God had never put our sins on his back, he would have never died. He would have been alive today. But thankfully, God put those sins on Jesus' back, which caused Jesus to die in his mortal body, but rise in his eternal soul, his eternal spirit, and gives us the same benefit. God defeated the devil on the cross, but he did it fully human, fully flesh and blood, so we too could defeat the devil, not in our own power, but in the power of the one, in the power of Jesus Christ, who's already had the victory, already won the victory of the devil over life and death. But here, the good news. Because Jesus, before Jesus defeated the devil on the cross, he had to defeat him in temptation, right? Before he defeated him on the cross, he had to defeat him in temptation. And again, the author of the book of Hebrews tells us Jesus had to face the same temptations as we do. And he was tempted just as we are tempted. So unlike Jesus, or unlike us, Jesus did not give in to temptation, which means Jesus did not sin. Jesus remained sinless. The book of Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 tell us, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, just as we are, yet he did not sin. You know, I read that and I think to myself, well, you know, Jesus never faced the loss of a business. Jesus never faced bankruptcy. Jesus never got married. So Jesus never had to go through a divorce. Jesus never faced cancer. Jesus didn't have any biological tittles. He didn't know what it was to raise a child. Jesus never went through what I'm going through. So Jesus couldn't be tempted in the way that I'm tempted. But we're made up of mind, body, and soul. Or mind, body, and spirit. And since we're made up of mind, body, and spirit, that's the only way we can be truly tempted. The circumstances may be different, but the devil can only tempt you in the same way he tempted Jesus. In your physical body, in your mind, or in your spirit, and Jesus shows us by illustration every way we can be tempted and how to overcome every temptation the devil can throw away. So we learn right away that no matter how full of the Holy Spirit you are, that doesn't exempt you from being tempted. It doesn't matter how close you are to God, that doesn't exempt you from temptation. I mean, we saw in the video that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, went into the wilderness, went into the desert to be tempted. So it doesn't matter how close you are, how full of the Holy Spirit you are, temptation will come your way. God will never tempt you. Now, we know this from the writings of Jesus, his brother James. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else to do wrong. Although God will never tempt us, he may very well lead us into the wilderness. And he does this because he loves us so much. He wants us to grow closer to him. He wants us to gain strength in our spiritual muscles so that we can overcome Satan, so we can overcome the spiritual battles that we face. So God will never tempt us, but he may have used in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil himself. Jesus had just gotten baptized. God the Father had just spoken these words. You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. And then, in other words, immediately after these events, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing at all and became very hungry. Lesson number three, God loves us so much, he'll sometimes lead us into the wilderness to be tempted. Yes. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, is led by God into the wilderness, led by God to be tempted by none other than the king of tempters, the devil himself. So don't ever think you become so religious or so spiritual you can't and won't be tempted. There is a spiritual battle going on in every one of us between the truth of God and the deceptions of the devil. The Bible, these ancient scriptures, which have been preserved for us for thousands of years, tell us what God calls good and what God calls evil. And yet the devil, 
and his demons. They try the hardest they can. They come after us, and often they succeed to lure us away from the truths of God. The devil tempts us and beckons us and with what looks good, but draws, away, draws us away from God's will. What looks good, but draws us away from God's purpose for our lives. And in order to satisfy our carnal or our fleshy, our evil desires, we justify what is not just. We justify what is not just. And if you think about it, most temptations really don't make a lot of sense, do they? I think I'll go out tonight. I mean, I know I've got work in the morning. I think I'll go out tonight and have a couple of drinks. I know when I go, I usually drink too much. I make a fool of myself. It's hard for me to get up the next day. But you know, after the week I've had, I deserve a couple of drinks, don't I? This is the one I think we have a lot of people named on to. I know I shouldn't go to church, but don't want it. I'm at the church of pasta preview. I like the fellowship of the comfy sofa. I know I need to learn God's word. I know I need to learn so I'm applied to my life. I know I need to learn so I can live life and live it more abundantly. But you know, this is the only day I can sleep in. My life ain't that bad anyway. This is one gets me in trouble. I know I shouldn't say this. But I gotta get in the last word. I know it's gonna hurt. Well, really, that's what I wanted to do, because she hurt me and I got hurt back, even though I know it's gonna make her mad or it's gonna drive her farther away from me. We justify what is not just. And when we do, we give in to temptation, which means we give in to sin. And temptation does many things, but we've been concentrating on three big things that if we give in temptation, if we sin, are gonna happen every single time. You will steal from your future. You will replace the important with the immediate, and you're simply telling God you don't trust Him. If we give in to temptation of any kind, whether it be some sort of addictive substance or an improper relationship or anger or being slothful or being greedy or whatever it is, we're taking something from our future self and we're putting something else into our present, which can and probably will affect our future in a bad or an unhealthy way. And the hard part is it's probably going to affect the people we love the most as well. We're replacing the important with the immediate. And any time we do these things, we're simply telling God, I can provide for myself rather than you can provide for me. Yeah. And the more we do this, the more we trust in ourselves, the less we begin to trust in God. Amen. It's so only when we get to the other side or when we're in so deep or we've lost that which is most precious to us, what is most important to us, do we realize we gave up what was important for the immediate gratification of the present. And in lesson four, and I hope you're filling these facts, because writing things down does help us remember it, be a good steward of what God gives you, and when you're done, don't throw it away. You know, if you need to, tape it on your refrigerator or put it in your Bible. Refresh your memory from time to time because temptation may leave for a while, but it always come back. My memory leaves for a while, it never comes back sometimes. So keep it with you so that you can use it at a later date. But as I said earlier, we're made up of three distinct things. We are physical body, our mind, and our soul. And the thing, our mind and our spirit, they, they last forever. They live into eternity. So, therefore, these are the only areas that we can be or where we will be tempted in because every temptation we ever have is going to be linked to one of these big three temptations which are recorded to us by our friend, Dr. Luke. We can be tempted in our physical bodies. And sometimes, sometimes, the temptation comes with a physical need like food. And it's a legitimate need. I mean, God created us to need food. God created us to need nourishment. That was the first thing the devil tempted Jesus with. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell a stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus has been in the wilderness for 40 days. He's ate nothing at all, according to the scriptures. He is hungry. He'd gone 40 days without eating. He was famished. He was malnutritious. His body needed a substance of food. It was a legitimate need. But what was at stake was not what was in front of him. When I am, when you are, when we are being tempted, what is at stake is not what is in front of us. What's at stake is your future and more than likely the future of your family and your loved ones. And Jesus knew what was at stake wasn't filling his hunger. What was at stake was something much greater than his hunger. What was at stake was this. If Jesus sinned, regardless of the reason why, if he gave into temptation and sinned, Jesus would no longer be sinless. And if Jesus was no longer sinless, he could not be 
the sinless sacrifice for sin. And if Jesus was no longer the sinless sacrifice for sin, there would be no sacrifice for sin. So not only did his future hang in the balance, but our future hung in the balance as well. That's right. It's the same way when you sin. We don't think about it. But not only does your future hang in the balance when you fall into temptation and sin, the future of those you love, maybe even those that you haven't even met yet, hang in the balance as well. The devil was tempted to, to get Jesus to fill a legitimate need. He had need in 40 days, and Jesus was very hungry, so the devil tempted him. And the devil will tempt us to fill a legitimate need in that illegitimate, improper, or irresponsible way. And we do it all the time. And it's so easy to see in others, but so hard to see in ourselves. Because we justify what is just. The devil comes after us in our physical bodies. We have this desire inside of us, and we have this desire for a certain pleasure, or we have a desire to fill a certain need or void in our lives, and it might be a legitimate need, it might not be, but this hunger, this temptation, is to fill this need in an illegitimate or improper or irresponsible way. And Jesus, he knows this. And he's not about to risk your salvation and my salvation to fill a legitimate need in an illegitimate, improper, irresponsible way. So he answers the devil by reaching into the Old Testament portion of our scripture and quoting God's word. He said, no, the scripture says people do not live by bread alone. See, in the moment, in the moment, it's about me and my desires. But if we give in to temptation, if we give in to sin, not only do we get hurt, but others get hurt. And sometimes it's even the people who come into our lives years later, at a later date, they get hurt as well. Who would have got hurt if Jesus had given in to sin? If he had given in to the temptation? Everybody in this room, everybody in the world would get hurt. There would be no sacrifice for sin, which would mean that there was no hope for life after this life. Jesus wasn't sinless. And when we get into temptation, we hurt others as well as ourselves. And some of us know this because we have been hurt by the sins of others. And we know we've hurt others by our sin. So God gives us this picture of how we can be tempted in our physical bodies and overcome this temptation. And then the second temptation, lesson five, God gives us an example of how we be tempted in our minds. And this is so important. Because when we speak of our mind, we're not talking about our brains. And as we're referring to it here, it's our consciousness, it's our awareness, it's our intellect, it's our understanding, it's the part of us that reasons and thinks and feels and wills and perceives and judges. And this is important because the brother of James, our brother of Jesus, the man named James, who wrote to the first century Christians, tells us this is part of us, this is the part of us where temptation actually comes from. He says, temptation comes from our own desires. The devil may tempt us, but here's the thing. He tempts us. The temptation comes from our own desires. Some translations even say our own evil desires. Desires, they're already in us. They're part of our sinful nature. They're part of our minds. The things the devil throw at us wouldn't be so tempting if they were something we didn't already desire, would they? I mean, that's just common sense. We desire it. Satan throws it our way and says, listen, you can have it. But James even goes deeper. He tells us why we fall into temptation. Knowing the why behind the what some part, but he also tells us where it's going to lead us. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Temptation comes from our own evil desires. Desires create an emotion. You start thinking about something. You start imagining it. The emotions drive us to our imagination. They enter into our imagination, and it gives birth to sin. The temple comes and tempts us with the world. The prospect of wealth or power or fame or all the above. And these things aren't bad in themselves. They're not bad in themselves. But I know, and I hope you know, God has a plan and purpose for your life. And the devil tempts us to take a shortcut to get what God has already given us. The deal is, you leave God out of the picture, and you can have a game without the pain. You leave God out of the picture, 
and it can be yours quicker and faster by laying down what you know is the right thing to do or not doing the right thing you know to do. And you don't have to lay it down forever. You just lay it down temporarily. I don't want you to do what you know to do. I don't want you to not do what you don't need to do. I want you to justify what you know isn't just, just to please your lust. Just for a little while. You ignore God. You give in to temptation. You give in to sin. And I'm going to put something before you that will make you put it before God. And you'll worship the idol. You'll bow down. Just this one thing is doing the right thing sometimes the wrong way. See, wealth in itself is not bad. But if you rob banks to get your wealth, that's bad. Fame in itself is not bad. Power in itself is not bad. But when you take shortcuts to get what God has already promised you, what God has already died on the cross for you, then you're falling into the temptation of sin. You're bound down. See, see the thing is, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're really worshiping that which is created instead of the Creator. You can have this thing that you desire without having to put in all the work and all the worship. In other words, you can have a cross without the sacrifice. That was the temptation that Satan had placed before Jesus. It's the same temptation he put before us. And when we do this, we sin. And when we sin, we just may miss out on what God's best is for our lives. Because God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us, for each of our lives. And you can't bend the rules, compromise God's word, and take shortcuts to get God's blessings and God's best. And when you try, you're never going to know what God will do on your behalf. Most of the time, when we do that, we settle for God's second best and never get his best. The devil tempts Jesus for the very thing that he came for, the kingdoms and of all the world and the people in the kingdoms and the power and the glory and the authority. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and the authority over them. The devil said, because they are mine, I can give it to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you worship me. This is what you came for, Jesus. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer the humiliation. You don't have to be beaten. You don't have to be nailed. I'll give it all to you now. You can have the pain. You can have the gain without the pain. You can have the cross without the sacrifice. It's all yours. All you have to do is just worship me for a moment. See, that's the thing we miss sometimes. Satan's never satisfied when we sin. That's why he keeps coming back after us. To do, most of us, he keeps coming after to do the same thing over and over because he doesn't just want you to sin. He wants you to worship him. And again, Jesus reaches into the Old Testament because he knows that this temptation gives way to emotion. Emotion gives way to imagination. Imagination turns into sin and sin leads to death. So he reaches into the Old Testament, the same book as he did before, the book of Deuteronomy. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord and serve him only. So we see it in these short verses how we can tempt in our physical bodies and in our minds. And now this last one, this last one is so important because it's the temptation of our spirit. Now, a couple things. First of all, we know our spirit last until eternity, and eternity is too long to be long. This is obedience versus rebellion, but it's such a subtle temptation. And the fact is, if you're not a Christian, or maybe you haven't become a Christian because you've seen how some Christians act, you're going to like this, because the more religious we are, the more spiritual we are, the more Christian we are, the bigger that this temptation gets. And the temptation is to assume or presume God's going to take care of whatever mess we get ourselves into. We spend irresponsibly and then ask God to bail us out. God has promised to fulfill all my needs. Didn't Jesus come so I could live more abundantly? We start quoting scripture. We live a promiscuous lifestyle and expect God to protect us from the dangers and the consequences of what we do. I'm healed by his stripes. We eat too much. We go to a doctor. We get a bad report and say, I believe God's already healed me because nothing is impossible with God. I Listen, I know everybody's telling me this is a bad... I mean, we have our own sort of Christian language for this kind of stuff. Don't we? 
I know this is a really bad idea, but I'm going to step out on faith. I don't have a good plan. I don't have any money. I don't